Everyone knows what DNA is, the hereditary material that contains information about a species. Most of the time, like between us humans, 99.9% .9 of DNA is similar. But even a mere 0.01% can produce so many differences. But have you ever wondered how we actually extract DNA? And how do we know that a certain sequence of proteins is responsible for a unique set of characteristics? Well, that's where DNA barcoding comes in. Instead of analyzing an entire DNA sequence, scientists only need DNA barcodes, or just small portions of the DNA sequence. With this DNA barcode, you could extract information for the identification of the species with our current sequence map, or a database of all existing DNA sequences. We call this concept DNA barcoding. Usually, DNA barcoding is used to identify species, especially when physical traits alone can't distinguish an organism. However, DNA barcoding needs a lot of laboratory equipment. During the time of the pandemic where laboratories are not as easily accessible, there is an alternative solution to describe species, and we call this geometric morphometrics. Geometry refers to shapes, sizes, position angles, and dimensions. Meanwhile, morphometry refers to the quantitative analysis of a size or shape. Combining these two terms, we get geometric morphometrics, the quantitative analysis of shapes, sizes, position angles, and dimensions. You might be wondering, how does this seemingly complicated topic have no laboratory equipment involved? Well, technically it does, as you need simple preservation tools for species, but it primarily revolves around the use of computer science and statistics. By using software, we can analyze images and provide interpretations of the geometry and morphometry of organisms. Geometric morphometrics is most often used for evolution and sexual dimorphism. Since evolution is about the change of characteristics of an organism, we can use geometric morphometrics as a tool to identify changes in shape of a particular characteristic, due to time and even the environment. On the other hand, sexual dimorphism revolves around the differences in appearance of both sexes in a species. As such, geometric morphometrics can show us if morphometry differences are truly apparent between sexes. And in my experience in the 8th AMGS conference for teen scientists, my group was able to study the geometric morphometric analysis of Hemidactylus vernatus hens, particularly focusing on sexual dimorphism. Geometric morphometric analysis is quite a tedious task, but I'm here to explain to you all the steps involved in it. First, let's start with the pre-geometric morphometric analysis tasks. Here, we're essentially identifying the research gap and species for eventual analysis. Number one, conduct a preliminary survey to gain information. Finding what is lacking in current research is essential to what your entire project will be about. Then, you could gather information about your target organism by checking its status in the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN list. Of course, you wouldn't want to perform experiments on near-threatened but critically endangered species. Once you find out that your target species is safe enough, you could survey for collection sites, plan your timeline, and draft a risk assessment. In the case of our project, we used Hemidactylus frenatus, an invasive lizard species that is easily accessible in our homes. Number two, prepare your pre-field tasks. This includes approving of permits, gathering equipment and supplies, and preparing forms and labels for specimen collection. For our case, since our lizard was an invasive species, our mentor said that there's no issue with it. Number three, conduct your field activities. Collecting and preserving your specimens is one thing, but you also have to accession, determine, and catalog them. This is basically sorting and identifying species based on collection date, collection place, sex, etc. so that you won't get confused when you get to the next step, which is data capturing. This is usually done in the form of taking clear pictures, and with proper categorization, your work will be immensely easier for the actual geometric morphometric analysis. I personally collected, preserved, and documented 13 lizards, although my groupmate got 14. However, we decided to use 12 each to get an equal number of male and female lizards. Once you've done all of these, you can finally go to the geometric morphometrics part. Number one, download the software. The software were provided by my mentor, namely TPS Util, TPS Dig, and TPS RELW. However, one of the limitations for the software was that it could only be downloaded on Windows, so my groupmate was the one who ran our data through them. Number two, using TPS Util, start landmarking. Landmarking is about plotting points to form the shape for further analysis. You'll need a reference for the landmarks you'll plot, and usually, you can find these in other journals. 
these points are usually in key parts of the organism. Once you've determined your points, you just click. Remember that the order of points is important. Then, we can make a links file, which is basically connecting all the dots based on the order you put them to form the shape. Do this for all the specimens, our pictures. Number 3. Conduct the relative warps analysis using TPS dig and TPS rel w. Through looking at all the links files, these software determine the mean shape. It also bends and warps the shape across different positions, depending on how many points you have to see possible variations of the organism. Number 4. Document the software-generated graphs and tables as you go. Since the software doesn't save these, you should keep a Google Doc at the side and prepare all your data for further analysis. Now, we can finally move on to the last book for study, Data Analysis. There is quite a learning curve with learning these statistical tests, considering we only had three weeks to conduct the study, but my mentor was able to help my group along the way. Number one, perform the multivariate analysis of variance or canonical variable analysis and discriminant results plus frequency distribution of discriminant scores. This is basically a series of statistical analyses to compare the shapes between species. In the case of our study involving sexual dimorphism, this series of statistical analyses were responsible for categorizing the shape to male or female. Then, we had to manually determine the correctly identified number of male and female lizards since this data was computer analyzed. In our case, only 50% of both male and female lizards were correctly identified by the computer. Number 2. Interpret the data. Through the correct and incorrect identified species, we can start interpreting if the sexual dimorphism is present. If most lizards were assigned correctly, then sexual dimorphism is present. If most lizards were assigned incorrectly, then sexual dimorphism is not present. Since half of the lizards were assigned incorrectly, then we can say that sexual dimorphism was not present in Hemidactylus fernatus lizards. And that's basically it! But of course, all kinds of studies have advantages and disadvantages. Unlike DNA barcoding, geometric morphometrics is more focused on the geometry, including the lengths, widths, and shapes among certain landmarks, which can be more useful if you're focusing on a specific part of the body. It can also look at asymmetries and phenotypic and ontogenic variation between animals of the same species. Paleontologists will also agree that geometric morphometric analysis is a more accurate determiner when looking at cladistics of species in the past, and the reasons why evolutionary traits may have occurred and taken shape. However, since geometric morphometric analysis is so data-heavy, there could definitely be a learning curve in using software and interpreting data. It's also one thing that the software's UI and UX are quite old. The number of landmarks or points could be insufficient to get the shape, which means that the essence of analyzing the uniformity of an organism could be lost. It also needs a lot of specimens to get an accurate analysis, usually a minimum of 30. And because we're talking about landmarking documentation, this kind of study usually needs the same laboratory, same equipment, and same person to ensure uniformity. Data also can't be replicated by scientists as specimens are unique. There is quite a learning curve with this kind of technical study, but I surely learned a lot. It opened my eyes to the intersections of data science and biology. In the near future, I hope to find myself working on a similar study. Of course, in an actual laboratory and with more time on hand.